from Alaska. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent for uh, 10 minutes for my remarks as well as 10 minutes for Senator Wicker and Senator Collins' remarks before the vote. Without objection. Mr. President, I think my colleagues are making the really important point of the national security implications of the bill that we're looking at voting on. And I uh, agree with what my colleagues have already said. Speaker McCarthy had a difficult job. I think there's a lot in this debt agreement that's important, that's positive. But the one thing we are not doing here and by the way, Mr. President, it's the most important thing we do as U.S. Senators is have a strategy for the national defense of our nation during an incredibly dangerous time globally. We're not doing that. We need a strategy. Already my good friend from South Carolina mentioned some ideas. I'm going to touch on those. But Mr. President, let's just reiterate you sit on the Armed Services Committee, many of us do. We get witness after witness, including the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the Secretary of Defense, saying this is the most dangerous time since any period in history since World War II. That's the consensus. Not a lot of people would disagree with that. Authoritarian dictators with immense appetite for conquest are on the march. And yet, what does this budget agreement do? It cuts defense spending significantly, as already mentioned. Now, some people will say, well, look at the top line. It's, we've never had a higher top line, 800 plus billion dollars. Mr. President, as you know, the actual real measure of how serious we are as a country isn't the top line because of inflation over the years. It's hard to compare. The real measure of how serious we are in terms of what we're putting towards defense, the number one priority of the U.S. Congress, should be in my view, is what percentage of our national wealth we're dedicating to defense. And this budget will take us in the next two years, with the cut this year, inflation adjusted cut of four to five percent, and a nominal increase next year of 1%, which would be about a 5 to 6% cut, it will take us below the 3% of GDP number for defense for the first time since 1999, during the peace dividend era of the Clinton administration. So we will, below, we will be below 3% of GDP. You look at different periods of American history, the Korean War, we're about almost 15%, Vietnam, 8%, Cold War, Reagan buildup, almost 6%, Iraq, Afghanistan, War on Terror, 4.5%. We're going to be going below 3%. Hasn't happened since 1999, and before that, it's almost never happened. In the history of the country, at least in the 20th century. And Mr. President, here's the most important point. In 1999, the threats to our nation weren't nearly as dramatic and serious as they are today. And nobody disagrees with that. So what this budget does is just accepts the Biden defense budget, which as Senator Graham has already mentioned, shrinks the Army, shrinks the Navy, shrinks the Marine Corps. That's what it does. Lesser ships, not more ships. Smaller number of soldiers and Marines, not more. So accepting the Biden defense budget is actually something new during the Biden administration. What do I mean by that, Mr. President? As Senator Cotton mentioned, the last two previous Biden budgets came in in anemic numbers and in a bipartisan way, strong bipartisan way, by the way, Democrats and Republicans significantly plussed up those budget numbers. Last year, a $45 billion increase to the weak Biden budget on the Armed Services Committee that every single senator on the committee voted for except one. About as bipartisan you, as you can get. The year before, it was a $25 billion plus up. 
And Mr. President, as many people know, we were already discussing in a bipartisan way on the Armed Services Committee another significant plus up to this Biden budget. So Democrats and Republicans knew it was weak and not sufficient to meet the challenges of today. But what happened? The music stopped. And now all of a sudden we're accepting the Biden budget. I know Democrat senators who think that is wrong. They think that is wrong. So, one amendment I'm going to offer as we're debating this, Mr. President, is to do something very sim simple. It's to look at the Biden Pentagon's priority list, their unfunded priority list, that this president and his Secretary of Defense put forward. It's $18 billion, which the Armed Services Committee, in a bipartisan way, was already getting ready to agree to move forward and fund. And I'm going to ask my colleagues, let's fund it. At a minimum, let's fund it. We're not going to bust out of the top line of this agreement. We'll just take that $18.4 billion and move it from the $80 billion IRS account and put it to the Pentagon. Pretty simple. Should be 100 to 0. Do we want more Navy ships, more Marines, or more IRS agents during this very dangerous time? I think the answer is pretty clear. I think the American people know the answer. So, Mr. President, Senator Cotton already mentioned this idea the speakers talked about. We need more efficiencies in the Pentagon. I couldn't agree more. By the way, the Navy leadership right now, um, we need a lot more efficiencies out of that place. You have a Navy secretary who's more focused on getting his climate plan out before his shipbuilding plan. The priorities in the, the Department of the Navy right now are remarkably misaligned with real-world challenges. And what are those real-world challenges? Mr. President, as I think you were there. We had a brief from some of our top intelligence agency officials, and they came out. It was a classified briefing, but I asked them if this number was classified. They told me no. They came out and said the real Chinese budget in terms of military is probably close to about $700 billion. That's a big budget. And as Senator Cotton mentioned, they are increasing in real terms 6, 7, 8 percent, cranking out ships, cranking out fifth generation aircraft. And we're going to cut the budget this year and dramatically cut it next year and go under 3 percent of GDP at one of the most dangerous times since the end of World War II. As Sen Senator Cotton also mentioned, the National Defense Commission that the Congress authorized a number of years ago to look at the serious national security threats facing our country came back to the Armed Services Committee two years ago and said, what we need to do to address these serious national security challenges from China, from Russia, from Iran, is have three to five percent real GDP or real growth on the defense budget. That was broadly accepted by Democrats and Republicans. As a matter of fact, I think one of the members of that National Security Commission is now the Deputy Secretary of Defense in the Biden administration. But we're not even close. We're going backwards. And Senator Graham's point about a supplemental to get Leader Schumer, the president, to say we are going to have a supplemental for deterring authoritarian aggression is going to be critical. And I would say, Mr. President, the vast majority of my colleagues here, Democrat and Republicans, would support that. We need a serious, robust defense budget to deter war. If the young men and women who volunteer to serve in our military are asked to go fight a war, we need a strong budget so that they can come home victorious, not coming home 
in body bags. This is deadly serious business. We're not putting enough attention to it. It's one of the number one things in the U.S. Constitution that we need to provide for the common defense, to raise and support an army, provide and maintain a navy. That's our job. And Mr. President, we're not doing it with this budget, this rush budget. We need to get serious, and hopefully in the next few days we can do that as we debate this agreement. I yield the floor.